Okay, good evening. We're going to get started, so uh, we have time to go through the whole program this evening. Uh, my name is Sherry Stable, and I'm from Harvard Bookstore. I'd like to welcome all of you to this evening's panel discussion on technology and culture. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank our two co-sponsors, the Harvard University Art Museum and the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at the Harvard Law School. I'd also like to give a special thanks to Christopher Leiden, who is here to moderate our panel discussion. He is from WBUR's Connection. Um, prior to introducing our panelists, I'd like to read um, a small passage from this month's Harper's. Um, it's an essay by William Gass, and as I was reading it um, last night, um, it felt like there's a, an interesting connection between what Mr. Gass says and what's going to happen here tonight. Um, I'll let you, of course, decide. Frequently, one comes across comparisons of the electronic revolution with that of writing and printing, and these are usually accompanied by warnings to those suspicious of technology that objections to these forward marches are both fuddy-duddy and futile. But Plato's worries that writing would not reveal the writer the way the soul of a speaker was exposed, that spontaneity would be compromised, that words would be stolen, and words would be put in other mouths than those of their authors, that writing does not hear its reader's response, that lying, hypocrisy, false borrowing, ghost writing would increase so that the hollow heads of the state would echo with hired words, and that oddly, the advantages and powers of the book would give power and advantage to the rich, who could learn to read and would have the funds to acquire and keep such precious volumes safe. These fears were overwhelmingly realized. And now to our panelists. Neil Postman, author of Building a Bridge to the 18th Century, How the Past Can Improve Our Future, is the Paulette Godard Professor of Media Ecology and Chair of the Department of Culture and Communication at NYU. He's the author of 20 books. He's on the editorial board of The Nation magazine. And he's the holder of the Christian Lindbeck Award for Excellence in Teaching. In Neil's book, he speaks of, and I quote, the importance of narrative and that we require a strong story to explain ourselves, why we are here, and what our future is to be, also where authority resides. He explains that when there's no narrative to generate a sense of purpose and continuity, a type of psychic disorientation takes hold. In its place, among many different groups, are those who seek meaning in the ingenuity of technological innovation. He refers to those who, looking ahead, see a field of wonders encapsulated in the phrase, the information highway. Neil calls these people information junkies who have no interest in the narratives of the past. Also joining us this evening is John Perry Barlow. He's a retired Wyoming cattle rancher, a former lyricist for the Grateful Dead, and co-founder and vice chairman of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. The Electronic Frontier Foundation, founded in 1990, is an organization which promotes the freedom of expression in digital media. In 1990, John applied, first applied, William Gibson's science fiction term, cyberspace, to the already existing global electronic social space, now generally referred to by that name. Until his naming it, it had not been considered any sort of place at all. He is a writer and lecturer on subjects relating to the virtualization of society and is a contributing editor of numerous publications, including Communications of the ACM. He has been a contributing editor for Wired since its first issue. His writings, which include his Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace as well as the Economy of Ideas, have been widely distributed over the net. Because of the former, he has been called the Thomas Jefferson of Cyberspace by Yahoo Internet Life magazine. Our third panelist is Stuart Brand, author of The Clock of the Long Now. We've actually been waiting for Stuart since last May. Um, Stuart was going to speak at the uh, Harvard Square Book Festival, and um, I think you got caught for about 24 hours between San Francisco and Nevada. We waited and waited and waited, all of us, and we're very happy you're here tonight. 
Uh, Stuart is the co-founder of the Global Business Network, best known for founding, editing, and publishing the Whole Earth Catalog. He's on the board of trustees of the Santa Fe Institute, an organization dedicated to multidisciplinary research in the science of complexity. He's the author of The Media Lab and How Buildings Learn. He also founded The Well, a computer teleconference community based in the San Francisco Bay Area. James O'Donnell, author of Avatar of the Word, is Professor of Classical Studies and Vice Provost for Information Systems and Computing at the University of Pennsylvania. He has published widely on the cultural history of the late antique Mediterranean world and is, recognized, and is a recognized innovator in the application of network information technology in higher education. In addition to his academic and administrative, administrative responsibilities, he serves as resident faculty master of Hill College House at Penn. Our final panelist, Larry Lessig, author of Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace, has been a Jack N. and Lillian R. Berkman professor for entrepreneurial legal studies and a professor of law at Harvard University. He's also a fellow at the Berkman Center. His new, be his new book, uh, literally hot off the press, he saw it for the first time this evening, discusses six topics as should cyberspace be regulated, and if so, how can it be done? He's the author of the classic paper, Reading the Constitution in Cyberspace, in which Lessig shows how code can make a domain, site, or network free or restrictive, how technological architectures influence people's behavior and the values they adopt, and how changes in code affect the pressing issue of free speech, intellectual property, and privacy in cyberspace. Finally, we're honored here tonight to have Chris Lydon, as I said before, of WBUR's Connection. He'll be moderating the panel as well as the Q&A session with the audience. At this time, I'd like to remind you that books uh, will be for sale after the event upstairs in the lobby, and that books will be signed also uh, at that time. At this point, I'd like to introduce Jonathan Zittrain, Executive Director of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at the Harvard Law School. Being the second introducer before a panel is a somewhat unenviable task. I resolved to be either funny, brief, or both. Uh, so welcome. Uh, my name is John Zittrain, and uh, along with Charles Nesson and Larry Lessig, we run and are run by the Berkman Center for Internet and Society and are delighted to co-sponsor the event tonight. Uh, this event is being webcast. <laughs> Well, at least I've managed funny. <laughs> Note how neither of my hands moves. So along with Ben Edelman, we run the Berkman Center for Ed Society. Ben is somewhere in this building uh, and is the person typing uh, on this side. He will be doing so for the duration of the event tonight, so I urge our panelists to be warned. <laughs> <laughs> and as I said, we're webcasting the event tonight. Uh, I guess that's really of no concern to you since you're here. I don't urge you to go out and listen to the webcast since you've already passed the phalanx of ticket mongers uh, to get here. And uh, actually, uh, scalping these tickets has been much better for us than the uh, bake sale that we did last year. So again, I thank you for your support. Uh, so with that, I guess we should uh, cut to the event. Uh, I'm sure it will be quite fun. Uh, if you do enjoy it, I urge you to visit our website at cyber.law.harvard.edu and see what else on uh, similar uh, ideas might be found. If you don't enjoy the event, please visit the Harvard Bookstore or their website at www.harvard.com. So um, thank you all again, and welcome to our panelists. I guess come on down and uh, get started. Good evening and welcome. Uh, I call it the Digerati Connection. We are going to get to the audience uh, connection style early on. We're gathered with impeccable timing <clears throat> to consider the future of everything we consider interesting in the early aftermath of the first finding of facts in the Microsoft case, the finding that it is indeed a monopoly. 
So the federal court, as Charlie Nelson said in our air this morning, has begun to frame the question of who owns cyberspace. I think it helps to think of it as a kind of uh, non-dimensional Louisiana purchase. Who's going to get to settle it? What are the rules of conversation in this new space? What is the relationship of the new territory to what we used to call affectionately culture? The federal court has framed and sort of begun to answer the question. We're going to fill it in and try to finish the discussion tonight. Bill Gates, are you listening? <clears throat> Clearly, if a bomb goes off in this room tonight, the whole American conversation will be delayed by at least 10, 15 minutes, maybe. Um, we're talking about uh, all aspects of it this evening. In one hour, I'm going to ask the panelists not to try to summarize their brilliant books, but to give us all, with appropriate emotion, uh, a general sense of where they think the cultural conversation is going in the electronic century, and uh, to be very clear about how happy, on a scale of 1 to 10, they are about it. Starting with Neil Postman, who we sense is not very happy about it at all. Uh, Neil, give us the big picture. <laughs> Well, uh, I won't try to summarize uh, the book, but I do have to mention uh, why I wrote it, because it's relevant to the way you put it, uh, Chris. Um, I, of course, it, the title is a takeoff on President Clinton's uh, often invoked metaphor of building a bridge to the 21st century. So I asked myself, well, what will we take across the bridge? Uh, will take all of the new technologies that we've developed, especially in this century. But I thought we probably would want to take some good ideas along with us, too. So then I thought, well, where do we get some good ideas? And uh, naturally, I thought of the 18th century, although the <clears throat> reviewer in the Times uh, Friday, who hated it. You were going mention, you know, uh, just, just forget it. I uh, said uh, uh, remarkably, I thought, that I arbitrarily chose the 18th century. Uh, <clears throat> it's known as the Enlightenment, of course, and there was nothing arbitrary about the choice. Well, uh, I, I, I do deal with uh, technology uh, in the book, of course, other things as well, which I won't uh, get into. Uh, but um, what I thought the 18th century would contribute to us is the conversation that was started in the 18th century about technology, specifically uh, whether or not um, technological innovation is the same thing as human progress. At the beginning of the century, there was great enthusiasm for science and, of course, technology, and many began to think that was the hope of the future. Uh, Rousseau, in, a fa in an essay that made him famous uh, in, in 1749, was really, in a way, the first one to raise the question as to whether or not uh, science, as well as technology, would uh, uh, corrupt or advance the human condition, and particularly our moral uh, status. Of course, his answer was they would not. And this was the beginning of uh, an interesting debate that uh, 18th century philosophers um, uh, engaged in about the role of technology in uh, culture. Uh, and I think we need this debate. Tonight is an example of it where um, uh, one does not have to take the position, uh, as some uh, think I have done, of, um, uh, of being against technology or hating technology. As I had a chance to say earlier, um, I think it's stupid to be anti-technology. We need uh, technology as we need food to live, but um, if food we eat is um, has no nutritional value, 
or if we eat too much or if our food is infected with disease, then what is a, a, a means of survival turns into its opposite. Can I, can I just ask you, interrupt, Neil, just to ask you a question? You're known as a critic of television, amusing ourselves to death and all that. Why shouldn't we think of um, the Internet, the, uh, the anti-couch potato, active, epistolary uh, Internet, as an alternative to television and everything you think is bad about it? Well, I mean, what do you mean? Why shouldn't we? Obviously, we sh we shouldn't because I think it is always unseemly, uh, at uh, best, to uh, to be uh, in love with technology. Uh, I think we could uh, we can put that forward as a possibility. In fact, I've done it myself. I I, I have wondered if, uh, let's say, email uh, will not help to restore some of the authority of the, uh, of the written word, uh, especially uh, do we need some sort of balance against a visual culture. So it may be that um, what you suggest is something we ought to entertain. It's too early to know, but we have to have serious conversations about it. And above all, never be in the position of adoring technology, which I think okay. many Americans are. Okay. But I, I hope we're going to distinguish, you know, different technologies. All of them electronics have different qualities, and there may be redeeming fe features of some of them. But forgive me, I'm going to be rude and just kind of push us along on the five-minute opening, uh, introdu you know, introductory round. John Perry Barlow is not pushing a book tonight. He and I are actually working together on something called Writer's Block, or why we don't have a book to sell and things like this. Um, John calls himself, his card actually calls himself a uh, uh, cognitive dissident. Cognitive dissident, yeah, I like it. <laughs> CD for sure. John, where are we going and how do you feel about it? First of all, I want to thank the bookstore for inviting somebody who does not have a book to sell. <laughs> that was awfully good. Me too. Uh, and and uh, aside from giving no excuse whatsoever, aside from laziness, uh, which I have. Uh, I want to say something about why I don't have a book. Uh, and it has to do with time, which I think is, is something that, that everybody on this panel is concerned with. Uh, I spent uh, the most of my life in the 19th century where time passed very slowly. I was born and raised on a cattle ranch in Wyoming, and I, and I ran it for 17 years. And time was very deliberate. And uh, then, since I knew I was unemployable uh, and had a significant antipathy toward all the manifestations of the industrial period, I uh, felt that the best thing I could do upon leaving the cattle business was to leapfrog in the 21st century where the moment was preeminent. Uh, and was precisely a different kind of time than what I'd previously inhabited. And I have become so entranced by the moment that trying to write about what is going on with the things that concern me, namely governance of cyberspace, uh, uh, the developing social ethics and codes of this unusual political region, all those factors, uh, has been such a moving target that I found that everything I wrote about it was uh, trivial and, and uh, out of date somewhat sometime the next week, which has now made me start thinking more seriously about, about what is eternal and what are the verities and how does technology relate to those things. Uh, I, had a, I had the delight this afternoon of having another one of my uh, world wrestling competitions with uh, Dr. Postman. Uh, we are often placed in this uh, completely ridiculous position of, of pretending to disagree with one another when, in fact, our values are almost exactly the same and our methods are only slightly different. Uh, and. I thought a little bit about what Plato said. Uh, in fact, uh, Neil quoted him uh, 
Uh, well, he quoted Irving Plato, uh, uh, but uh, I think <laughs> the it might have been Plato. Might have been, yeah, the, the Plato, the much younger. Uh, <laughs> but uh, at one point, he was talking about you know what what Plato uh, feared and how it had, how it had come to pass, and and it occurred to me that there was also something contained in his very presence uh, in that room at that moment which was that had one taken a transcript of what Neil had to say and and simply put it out over the internet or put it in a book, uh, it wouldn't have contained uh, any large percentage of the content of the presence of Neil as he is. That there was much more in his, in his uh, conveyance of himself and his ethics and his spirit in that moment than there than there could be in the transcript, and that's part of my excuse for not writing a book. Uh, besides, this, you know, it's both better paying and and uh, and more enjoyable to go around being oneself than than uh, writing about it. Uh, I think that you know I think about what the folks on this panel are are trying to achieve. And I think that what we're all trying to achieve is growing a set of values that can sustain us uh, during a period of rapid technological change. And, and we all care, I think, about, about the things that have always mattered. I think it's important to note that there is very little in the Canterbury Tales that doesn't seem quite familiar, despite all the technological change that has taken place. Uh, there is almost nothing in Shakespeare that seems odd to us, uh, despite that. Uh, my Forgive me, John, but you're talking about growing a set of values. What, what might they look like? I think they're going to look like the same set of values that human beings tend to try to grow all the time, which are the values that, that occur in the space between the, you know, the seven deadly sins and the three graces. Uh, they, are, they are those those things that we always battle with. How, how to how to correct our worst impulses uh, uh, while giving them enough head to give ourselves uh, vitality and steam, and and technology doesn't change this much. My my mother, who just died a, a while back at 93, spent the first uh, quarter of her life growing up in Wyoming, where the fastest way to move information was a galloping horse and uh, was writing the email at the time that she was dying. Uh, and yet, none of her stories included technology at all. They were about what goes on between human beings. And, and, and the one question I want us to all consider with regard to technology is, is does it connect human beings or does it separate them? And that's, that's the, the most valuable question that should be preoccupied. You've located your mother in the story, which is always the first important uh, thing. Uh, thank you. That's important. Uh, Stuart Brand is also an early settler of the New Territory, polar cataloger, media lobster from the beginning. Uh, and he's written a book on a real thing, a park along now being built by the, the uh, computer maven Danny Hillis. Stuart Brand, welcome. Well, I guess the uh, operative sentence of the book and the project, and to some extent, I suppose, what might be said tonight is the notion that civilization is revving itself into a pathologically short attention span. And that's happening probably for several reasons. One is when you have a global economy and everything is based on economic behavior, often you sort of wind up with the next quarter view of life. Um, democracies actually lead people to a short attention span, I think, because you're uh, always looking at the next election. Technology has let us do more and more multitasking. It'll be amazing if no cell phones go off this evening. Uh, thank you if they don't. But that is something else that gives us a feeling of we're uh, doing too much too fast, that there's a revving up going on. But mostly it's the, the not just perceived, but actually clearly quite palpable acceleration going on in several technologies. Information technology is the one we tend to refer to often now. But biotechnology is going to be so much more ferocious and so much closer to a sense of what's human and what are values and so on 
that I think we'll, historians will look back on the acceleration of Moore's law and information technology as the, the softening up for what will come with biotechnology. And also materials technology, single wall carbon nanotubes and nanotechnology and so on is coming very rapidly. Um, so I think the, the, the way I would talk about these technologies is persistently accelerating technologies. Moore's law wouldn't have been a big deal if it had stopped going from two to four to eight transistors on a chip. But when you get millions and you're approaching the calculate, uh, calculation capabilities of brains uh, and then swarming right on past the density of brain uh, calculation, then something serious keeps going on. So these asymptotic exponential curves that, that uh, take off and keep taking off are the thing that we're dealing with these days. Now, personally, uh, I don't know if Neil will approve, but I adore a lot of these technologies. I really am charged up by them. And you know, I'm 60, and at some point I'm going to say, OK, you guys just go ahead. I'm, I'm just going to watch. But for the time being, it's always <laughs> pretty neat to surf. And so, in a sense, the idea of building a 10,000-year clock, or we also are working on a 10,000-year library, is to help make the world safe for acceleration uh, at times, for speed, for fast-moving parts of a, of a healthy civilization. Um, there are some parts that go slow. Culture is one of them. Culture, as defined by one of our board members, Brian Eno, is everything you don't have to do. And so the way you do your hair, the way you shake hands, um, the way people get together to have a, uh, this kind of an audience and panel talk, these are they're not necessary. They're not you know, really food, shelter, survival. They're the way we arrange things. And one of the amazing and important parts about culture is that it moves slowly. And so in a sense, if you've got a healthy culture, you can have a fast-moving technology. And part of what we're figuring out these days is when things are really moving fast, you want a really healthy culture. And that's the question that I guess my book is raising, the clock is posing, and the 10,000-year library will hope to help solve. Thank you. Do you, want to, do you want to describe the clock, as Danny Hillis does? I mean, do you want to describe the real clock and, and Danny Hillis who conceived it? The real clock is a, uh, the world's slowest computer. It calculates when it's built probably uh, twice a day. Be something uh, the big one will be 80, 90 feet high inside a mountain, which we've now purchased in eastern Nevada, 2,000 foot high, white limestone cliffs. It's uh, it's Mount Rushmore without the carvings on the outside, but with Jefferson's brain inside, basically. <laughs> so it looks like a beautiful mountain with 5,000 year old bristlecone pines on top. And the clock really is a big slow clock. It has a Stonehenge-like quality to it but it is a, a Victorian-like mechanism that you can walk up through and take a couple hours and you come out the top, have a sense of deep time, human deep time, not geological time, not astronomical time, but just, you know, 10,000 years is civilization so far. Figure we're in the middle of the story and another 10,000 years of the story. What's our feeling of where the story wants to go and where do we fit in it? That's what the clock's supposed to help us think about. Thank you. Uh, Jim O'Donnell is uh, really the only person on the panel who is qualified uh, linguistically and historically to talk about Plato the Elder. He's a classical historian of the way we connect historically, I mean intellectually, and have done it historically. His book is called Avatars of the Word. Jim O'Donnell. Well, I'm trained to do my best thinking about the remote past, and in that book, I try to do some of that, to put some history alongside the preoccupations of academics and cultured people at the end of the 20th century. It strikes me, and has struck me in the course of writing this book, that we waffle back and forth too often between the alternatives of fantasy and fear when we look at the technologies of the future coming towards us. In the book and elsewhere, I've tried to recommend that we cultivate a third approach, uh, and I would characterize that approach simply as desire. One of the things I learned when I went looking for comparable moments of cultural transition in our histories is that prediction rarely succeeds. To the extent prediction succeeds, it succeeds by giving voice to fears that usually do come true. I was struck by that quotation from William Gass and Sherry Sable's preface to our program. Um, it is, in fact, the case that 
printing let loose religious unorthodoxy on the world. If that's what you were afraid of, that's what came true. But predicting that in the 15th, 16th century was hardly enough to predict the world of modernity that was coming headlong towards those people. What I've learned is that empowering and transforming technologies produce new economies of information, new economies of scale that simply go far beyond what people can imagine at the moment of transition. My strongest belief is that all of our fears and all of our fantasies err chiefly uh, by being one or two orders of magnitude at least too modest in their proclamation of themselves. If prediction isn't going to work, then we are reduced to a couple of alternatives. We may become prophets, and I had the pleasure of talking to Neil Postman before we came up here uh, about McLuhan as prophet. I write about him a bit in my book. But if prophecy, uh, that is to say, proclaiming truths about the future that no one around you will believe, isn't uh, as practical or hard-headed a thing as you want to do, the alternative to me seems to be strategy. And by strategy, I mean desire that takes itself seriously, desire with attitude, desire that is determined uh, to bring about a world in which it has its way. Uh, and there I connect what I say and think to what John Perry Barlow was just saying. Uh, growing a culture of values, finding the values that are important for us, and that's important because I am optimist enough to believe that the tools we are given by technologies allow us, if we are wise and resourceful, to take advantage of them precisely to achieve at least some part of what we desire, as much of what we desire as human beings are ever given to achieve in this life. And on the other hand, I'm very sure that if we sit back passively and ask ourselves questions about what will technology do to the world, then it will do a great many things to us that we would very much rather it didn't. Uh, and my task for my life and the task I recommend for my friends and colleagues uh, is to shape the future that you will have to the extent that you can do so. It's exciting. Jim, just to fill in, what's your, what's your worst fear? What's your brightest fantasy? And then steer, steer through it with desire. I would say my worst fear and a reason that led me to these studies and to some of the things I've done uh, is that I will get old and be unhappy with the world as it has come about. Um, and I have seen enough of my colleagues fixed in worldviews of 20 or 30 years ago, hoping they can make a career out of the ambitions they had when they were 20 or 30, uh, and being somehow disappointed in what turns out, uh, that I would rather cast my lot with that future and try to make something out of it, rather than hope I can hold on to enough of the present uh, and enough of what I thought when I was 20 or 30 uh, in order to make a life out of that. Um, my greatest hope? My greatest hope is that we will all know and get to know and experience life with a wider variety of more interesting people and have more transforming human relationships because of that. And so far, the first 10 years of cyberspace, I see that working for a lot of people. Thank you. That's great. Um, Mark Lessig is a law professor, uh, again, a sort of early man into the field with a lot of attitude. His book is called Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace. I translate it for non-lawyers in the group like me. Okay, here's the translation. Um, cyberspace has a constitution, not a legal document, not a, anything lawyers have anything to do with, really, but a way of life, a set of values, customs, and this custom and way of life is given to us. It has been given to us in part by the architecture of this space, by the way it's designed. This design, this architecture, is inscribed in its code. And that word simply means the software and hardware that makes it as it is. Now, like the other constitution, the one I teach my students, this was given to us. And given to us in an extraordinarily uh, undramatic way, it appeared. And it created an extraordinary innovation in our society. Creativity was democratized, in a sense. No longer did you have to go to a publisher to get permission to publish. You could publish on the net. You could produce music and distribute it without EMI giving any kind of permission or requirement to do it. You could bring stuff to market without any of the permissions of those who control access to the market. It was this democratizing character of cyberspace that enabled its innovation. Now, the fear that I have, and the fear that this book is about, 
is that we treat this feature of cyberspace, this architecture, and the freedoms that this architecture gives us as, in some sense, natural, as if it just comes with cyberspace, as if it's something we don't need to defend, as if it will always be there so long as there's something connecting our computer with something called email. And that's fatally mistaken. Because the architecture of cyberspace is just one architecture that cyberspace could take. There are many possible architectures. And there are many forces that are trying to change the architecture of cyberspace, to move it from this empowering, democratizing, creative space to a space that is once again controllable. Now, most people focus on government when they think about that problem. Most people think it's the government we need to fear. And I think there's lots to fear in the government. But what we're missing as we obsessively focus on the government is the way it's being changed by commerce. It's commerce that is transforming the architecture of the Internet and re-enabling the kinds of control on innovation which marked our life before cyberspace came. So there's this mean, this way of thinking about it. It's the return of the 1970s. That's our future if we don't think about this freedom that cyberspace gave us. Because the return of the 1970s means that there is a recreation of structures of control that once again require you to get permission to publish. That's called licensing to deal with the copyright problems. That you get permission to send out music through code that makes it possible to control whether the mu music can be distributed. That you get permission to come to market on the World Wide Web. That's what patent law is doing. Basically, my students are destroying the creativity that defined cyberspace, this constitution given to us by people down the street at MIT. And my book is about our need to discover these values and defend them, because it's given to us and we will lose it as we pathetically focus on the evil of some pathetically misguided thing called government. That's not the danger. It's the slow transformation under the cover of Disney. That's the fear. Wow, okay. So, so it's basically uh, MIT is, you have the good guys, Harvard Law School are the bad guys. And I also see this thing shaping up as four optimists and one pessimist sort of wrestling over the future. Uh, Larry, just in a minute or so, it strikes me that uh, Judge Jackson's ruling on Friday can be read as a kind of huge wake-up call to all of us that the architecture has not been certified yet or settled, uh, and it ought to be up for grabs. Do you want to read out the judge's uh, findings about, on the Microsoft case and how they bear on this question of uh, citizens taking control of the architecture? Uh, do I have to? You may. <laughs> Briefly. Oh, yeah. So 207 pages um, summarized. Um, uh, it is the same question. I don't think it's an interesting question anymore, really. I think the Microsoft battle... It's interesting that he did it, isn't it? No, it's interesting that he did it. And um, uh, uh, there's a lot more to come. It's just the first step. It's finding of facts. We don't know what the law conclusions will be. Uh, but the Microsoft battle is an old battle, I think. And I think there are much more important battles going on right now about the architecture and how it will evolve. Cambridge just came down strongly on the side of open access in broadband cable. That's an extraordinarily important battle. And uh, it's a battle between people who are saying, wait, open access is the architecture of the Internet. And on the other side, there's a company called AT&T that is building an architecture that's closed and doesn't allow for uh, competition that constitutes the Internet. It's one step back, not the 1970s, 1920s that we're going back to. There's one debate. There's one place we can talk about fighting the future of the architecture of the Internet. And that's a place that's going to matter. I mean, this Microsoft case has been going on really for six years. And um, I'm not sure what will happen out of this sequence. Uh, it's not the biggest problem is there's a lawyer, there's a the, one of the chief economists at uh, at the Justice Department has this metaphor. It's like the dog chasing the fire truck. What happens when he catches it? Like what does he do? Okay, uh, yeah, please. I was going to ask Neil. It seems to me you are the you are the uh, skunk at the garden party here. Uh, uh, 
I want you to warn us, Neil. Be very clear about what you're warning us about. No, no, no. I just wanted to ask uh, a question um, on this matter of structure of con structures of control. Would you be? Uh, you think it would be a good thing or a bad thing if one didn't need a license to be a lawyer? If there were no bar exams, it was just open. Uh, anyone could do it. There were a lot of lawyers before they yeah, were licensed. Yeah, that's true. But now they are licensed. So I'd like to know if you think, uh, do you think it would be a good thing if there were no license to be a physician? We, you were talking about structures of control. Um, you don't want um, editors to tell people what they can publish. How about with doctors and lawyers? Um, I, I think there's too much structure of control over who can be lawyers. Different story on doctors. I'm not against editors. My editor, one of my editors is here, very much in favor of my editor. Uh, but I, I just want to, I want to focus on how the values of this system are changing. And we can argue about whether it's good or bad. Um, and in fact, my book spends much of its time trying to say, how do we translate the values of the 18th century? Not with as much uh, flair as your book does, but how do we translate the values of the 18th century into a world where this is its reality? But the reality is, this architecture is now constituting our values, and it is changing, and we should decide whether we want it the way it will become or the way it is, instead of this uh, mindless sort of let's, let's let things take care of themselves, which is where we are. Yeah, the architecture doesn't just simply constitute the values. It enables them. I mean, it puts us into a condition where we are thrown back to ethics instead of laws and regulations, I mean, as it presently stands. Now, I'm, you know, perfectly willing to live in a state where uh, doctors and lawyers and, and others who might behave in certain miscreant ways are, are contained by public awareness of the, of the uh, ethical conduct or, or misconduct rather than some state examining board that decides whether or not they're appropriately uh, configured to their jobs. Neil, do you want to give us an explicit warning about this uh, jungle we're headed into? And then I want to ask the audience to sort of redirect the conversation if they like. Well, I, I mean, I, 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 don't, I, I wouldn't use that metaphor. I mean, I don't think it's a jungle. Uh, we're, we are heading into uh, something new. Um, for example, um, Larry Grossman wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Electronic Republic, in which he says that this, the new, this new architecture will allow for uh, instant plebiscites on every political issue so that we will not need or we won't have um, representative government, but direct participation. So citizens could vote uh, uh, if we should send troops to Bosnia or we should uh, uh, join NAFTA or anything of this sort. Now, he, he thinks this is a good idea and then says that it takes us back to uh, the participatory democracy that the Greeks had in the 5th century BC in, in Athens. Of course, one immediately uh, thinks uh, that uh, 5,000 slave-holding men on a hillside in Athens uh, making political decisions are completely different from 250 um, uh, Americans in diverse and heterogeneous um, uh, people coming to some sort of conclusion. But uh, it is a question we have to ask ourselves. If this new architecture will change the meaning of democracy, I, I don't know, Chris, if this is a new jungle, but it would be something new, a different concept. Uh, con eventually, perhaps Congress and the Senate would not really be necessary because the population can directly decide these questions. Well, then we have to ask that, not that you don't want us to ask, uh, is this what we want? Now, if it's not what we want, 
then maybe we have to modify the architecture of this or modify ourselves in some way so that we will retain what it is we want. And even though the technology would make possible something new, we might want to reject it. John, please, and then and then uh, I want to, uh, to hear from the floor. We're, we're, we're again we're uh, conspicuously uh, six white guys up here too. It'd be nice to hear from other persuasions. But John, take another that take a crack. The worst, that would be the worst possible thing that could happen. The architecture doesn't lend itself well to that. We already to which John to the, to uh, uh, in instantaneous plebiscite. I mean, we already have democracy working too well in this country. We have government by hallucinating mob. <laughs> and you see why we need the last thing I wanted for it to get worse. Please, from the from the floor. In the in the white shirt. Uh, in, in a three forty eight experimental machine, Frank Kurzweil suggests that within a couple of decades the computers uh, will exceed human intelligence and that the inevitable result of this will be a merger between uh, humans and machines, I'd like to hear uh, your opinion. Will be assimilated in resistance futile? <laughs> I don't know whether he's an optimist or a pessimist. <laughs> he's an optimist. <laughs> Ray Kurzweil, a pessimist? There's well, no, I mean, I imagine one. Um, you know, there's so many degrees of these things. It, it, I remember an argument about AI, artificial intelligence. It's always been, well, you can talk about AI, but machines can't actually do X. They can't beat humans at chess or anything. They can't do language, whatever it is. And then each time machines would come along and play chess better than humans or do language pretty well, people would say, well, that's not AI, actually. And so I think what you've got is this kind of moving membrane between uh, what's possible and what we fear in some funny way. And the way the, the problem that you raised has often been stated is what happens when machines get smarter than us? And they can do very well in outer space, and they don't need to eat as much, and you know, they would regard us as the platform that made them possible and then throw us away. Um, that's a plausible scenario. You could actually go pretty far with that. Uh, if that might be the case, then we should be their best friends now rather than <laughs> find out later or not. Neil Postman's in trouble. Yeah, Neil, go ahead. <laughs> Jim O'Donnell. So look, look, the thing to watch for in biology, and, and I, I promise you, Marlo, that it's not pond ecology we should be talking about, it's microbe ecology, you know, fast turnover time. They reproduce every half hour, they're all one species, they mix traits uh, promiscuously all the time, and the, the world culture and the world economy and, and the world technology, I think, is getting more and more microbial in that sense. It's very fast moving, it's very promiscuous. Uh, that doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means it's somewhat different. And my guess is that just as life has gone from stage to stage through symbiosis, this will be another one of those stages. Jim, it uh, seems to me it's worth thinking both the long now and the short now. Tomorrow makes 10 years the fall of the Berlin Wall. That's an appropriate symbol uh, that we've lived in a century in which many different societies and many different cultures felt they needed to hold on to protections, restrictions, controls, and licenses of one kind or another that turned out, even in only the short to medium term, to be unnecessary. And I think in the long run of history, we see that most of our controversies are about restrictions held on to ferociously that then turn out to have been irrelevant and uh, not, not as useful as we thought. James. Um, I guess in response to uh, The hallucination is definitely something that is created by the media, though 
my my sense of mass media is that they there is a very circular process between the media and the masses. I mean, it's uh, media mass media exists to confirm the delusions of the masses and amplify them. Uh, but if you spend any time around Congress you realize the extent to which they are entirely market driven by whatever fantasy has seized the populi at any given moment, whether whether that has any basis in experiential reality or not. That's what I'm getting at. So it's a hallucinating moment that's sort of managed. When I, when I, when I, well, it's, it's just, the thing is that it, it, you know, it, it, Congress is extremely responsive to problems that don't exist. <laughs> God, I don't want to go back there. I spent years analyzing it, and uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting that we pass it, and you know, it has yet to have any noticeable effect. Let's move, please. You. My theory is that the internet was created by people who read a lot of science fiction when they were adolescent males and got the world view at that point, and the internet reflects that. I mean, the, the internet actually it shows that culture scales uh, very well regardless of how many people enter it. I mean, it still has the culture of the model railroad club at MIT. <laughs> and, and, and they were a pretty libertarian bunch because, you know, well, people who are socially dysfunctional often are libertarian. <laughs> and they're the good guys, remember. Good. Advocate architecture in that one architecture could enable exactly the kind of interaction you're talking about. Another architecture could disable it. And if you think it's important, if it's a value to enable the kind of interaction you're talking about, then I'm only saying we ought to be pushing towards that architecture and away from architectures that disable it. Just like if an architecture enables a single actor to be a choke on the development of what the internet will become, and there's another architecture that doesn't have a single, single actor as a choke on what the internet will become, we should prefer the architecture that doesn't have the chokehold over one that does. And so it's not, I agree, you don't want to put technology over values. I don't, I don't know what that would mean, um, except if you're a techno weirdo. Um, uh, but if you focus on the values, then you ask which architectures help us bring those about. And that's what I think to talk about right. architecture. That's, that's something that everybody on this panel agrees about. I mean, this is, if, if anything, that's, that's the unifying theme here, which is that it's, it's both to, tools and rules, but not imposed rules. Rules that come up from within because the tools make it possible for them to emerge naturally. Thank 
against Christ. Enforcing the rules. Well, uh, to some extent, um, uh, the uh, the structure of a technology does have a, a program, does have a bias. I mean, if you build uh, a 747 jet, you're not going to use it to carry the garbage from Boston, from Cambridge to Boston or something. You're going to use it for intercontinental travel. So the built into the structure of uh, a technology is a set of uh, instructions or biases about how it's to be used. So we sh and we should never underestimate that. But to some extent, we have considerable control. I mean, over television, for example, there is nothing uh, in the structure of the medium itself that would have made us turn it over to Procter and Gamble, or I'm using that as a, a metaphor of American uh, corporate interests. So we made television. I mean, what is television about in America? It's about selling audiences to advertisers. That's, that's what it's about. Now, there's nothing inherent, I think, in the structure of television that would have led a culture to do that. And in the early days of television, and indeed the early days of radio, uh, it was unimaginable. In fact, Herbert Hoover, the symbol of all uh, conservatism, when he was Secretary of Commerce, addressed the matter of radio and thought it, was, it would be unthinkable to use radio for commercial purposes. He thought it was the great instrument at long last of public education. It still could have been. It isn't a present company. Uh, but, and the same with television. So, uh, uh, there, you, you see what I'm saying? There are two sides to this. We must not underestimate the power of the <clears throat> structure of the technology itself to drive the, uh, how it's going to be used. But we are never powerless to exert some sort of control over that. Yeah, that, that's a very deep point. I, I just wonder if anybody else would like to sort of chime in on the question, particularly after the Microsoft uh, findings on uh, what might be done, what could be done, will be done, what the judge is suggesting uh, ought to be done about property rights and commerce as the driving uh, rules of the game on the Internet. Let me, let me just try one. I'm agreeing with people so much it worries me. Um, when I was working on this book, The Media Lab, I got looking at, at uh, Poole's book, Technologies of Freedom, and he made a point that I hadn't noticed, which is that uh, at least broadcast technologies, as they emerged in various places around the world in parallel, much the freest ones were in countries that were highly commercialized. That is where the, uh, where the newspapers, magazines, television and so on were intensely commercial. They carried commercials. And one of the amazing things about these commercial sponsors is they pretty much don't care what you say. Whereas when it's governments that are sponsoring these various media, they care very much what you say and they regulate it ferociously. And this goes a little bit against you know what we're saying here that commerce is the great threat to the internet because if it is that's the first time that's been the case. Mitch Capehorn and I made commerce possible on the internet by founding the Kicks, and, and I'm not displeased that we did that. Uh, but I, I also think that commerce has a tendency to to assume that that its basis is property, because it's been so affixed to property as as uh, you know commerce being something of the physical world. Property makes sense in the world of physical goods because they're definable. Information is actually not a noun. It's a, it's a verb. Information is a relationship. Expression is a relationship. And the ownership of information in a dis disembodied or, or a dematerialized form makes about as much sense either economically or practically as claiming to own your friendships. I'm looking at the pragmatics here. Um, to have a 
increasingly global internet where anybody and everybody all the time can get into connection and have these relationships with one another raises the question of who pays for that infrastructure, for that process, and so on. If governments pay with taxes, that is, we pay through the governments for the taxes, it's it's regulated and paid for to a certain level. People pay the internet didn't really take off until the, the, the internet didn't really take off until the dot coms outnumbered the dot orgs and the dot edus. The dot orgs and the dot edus did not go away. The gift economy of the internet has not gone away. But so it, you know, it looks to me like we should be grateful for commerce here. Yeah, but let's. But I think there's a point that uh, John made that we should focus on: the role of property in the story. Um, you know, we, we come from a culture where the belief is unless you protect property firmly, there will be no progress. Uh, we think we won the Cold War on that idea. Property is at the core of progress. And But what we fail to do when we believe this thought is distinguish between two kinds of property. One is real property that John was talking about. The other is intellectual property. Intellectual property has never in our tradition been understood as something that should be protected absolutely. It's always been understood as a balance. The, con the Constitution says we give the right to protect intellectual property for limited times, and then these ideas get turned over to the public. It's always been understood as a balance. Now, when I was railing against commerce, I was railing against where commerce is taking us, how it's changing the Constitution of the Internet. And, it's, and here's one very particular example, the explosion of intellectual property rights, not just the strengthening of copyright beyond uh, any imaginable relationship to its initial uh, founding conception, but this explosion of patents as they apply in cyberspace. So for example, Amazon.com claiming it has a patent on one click and telling Barnes & Noble it and no other company in the world, unless they have Amazon's permission, can use a one-click concept. <laughs> now, there are, there's an extraordinary industry, and this is what I meant by my students, of lawyers out there who are spending all their time filling out these patent applications, and these petty bureaucrats in Washington who are issuing these government-backed monopolies that control what you can do in cyberspace. And this, in five years, I think, uh, is the environmental disaster of cyberspace, because it will change us from a place where anybody can go out there and set up one click or two click or zero click or whatever you want, and that's creativity, that's the democratized creativity into a world where the only people who can exist in this space are those that can hire my students. Now, my students like that, but it's not a cyberspace we knew or that you built. Please. They're, they're going to care if geeks like your husband make Linux easier to load. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the problem. It's a chicken and egg because right now I don't think there are too many applications out there that the average person just buy. Well, this is this is where desire comes into the equation. But I think open source is much more important than software. Open source is an idea that the open source movement, a free software movement before it, uh, but continues to embrace the idea of opening up the basic uh, elements of our culture, right, and making it op open for others. Now, there's a very important point about open source software and this fear of the libertarians or fear about government. It's harder for government to regulate open source software than it is for it to regulate closed software. When the government wants to get uh, Microsoft or any company to embed in its code tools that make it easier for government to regulate, it's hard to resist it because it's right there in the code compiled. And it's like that. How, how can you use the Microsoft Mining Act for small old news? I mean, like sort of the, the Goliath that, that of closed architecture? Well, because the Microsoft case is about events that occurred years ago. 
generations ago in Internet time. Um, and for the very same reason you're pointing to, I think open source is an extraordinary explosion of change. Now, I don't know what effect that has on the legal outcome of that case, but I think the, in, the explosion of excitement around open source is about a different uh, competitive environment, and one which is an important check on the power of government to regulate generally. And I think this is a value that open source brings, not just for code, but open systems generally. Also an important check on the ability of commerce as it's been defined to regulate cyberspace. I mean, it, the open source is enormously important in keeping cyberspace free and in, keep, and, and in creating a, a garden of human creativity such as we've never seen before. Please, on the, on the aisle. Well, both Veronica and Newman, they think so. In California, they do the same thing, but New England is never mentioned. <laughs> Well, let's hope that they all join in. Uh, I mean, what do you find in Africa, Jennifer? I, 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 I've spent a good chunk of the last three years in Africa and, and increasingly in South America, and I am absolutely convinced that the great powers of the 21st century are going to be the very powers that lost out over the last two centuries because they don't have the habits of mind uh, that were imposed by the industrial period. They have horizontally networked societies. Uh, and they are ready for information economy in an enormous way, and they're finding ways to get it. First, that out, John. How, really, how are they going to use it to do how what? How are they going to use it? To communicate, to, th to, to join themselves together in, in exactly the way that they have been before, and also to create economies. I mean, the most powerful nation on this planet in 50 years is, is going to be the Chinese nation. And by that, I do not mean any nation state. I mean the nation of, of global people who are Chinese who understand what it is to have a horizontally networked economic system based on relationships. You add electronic technology to this, and they're going to be very powerful indeed. Could I suggest another nation that's growing, which is the non-native English-speaking English speakers, who, if they do not now, will shortly outnumber the native English speakers. And English, which now seems to be the imperial language, will turn out to be uh, the liberating lingua franca precisely for those cultures. Yeah. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I, I think European, is just, I, I worry about Northern Europe. I think they may, they may be in trouble in 50 years, serious trouble. Not Scandinavia. Except for Scandinavia, but they're sort of why, 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 why? <laughs> why, why, are they, why do you accept them? Uh, because they just simply don't get it. Uh, culturally or, or economically, they have the European uh, Commission, which is which. I was wondering why you accept the Scandinavians. Well, well, fortunately, they have the good sense to stay out of it uh, and stay yeah. out of being out of it. I don't know. So, I mean, they don't. They don't believe. They don't. They don't believe in in the European Union particularly. They've stayed out of. They've stayed away from the European Commission. Uh, they do not accept the kinds of assumptions of industrialization that are dominant in France and Germany and England. They bought English as a lingua franca earlier than these other areas. I think they're much more globally oriented. Uh, everybody in Finland goes around and Nokia nailed to the side of their head. <laughs> Uh, let me just say, the connection rule is that the best conversations come to an end after one hour, precisely. And uh, Neil Postman and I have to leave. Um, I'd like to ask for uh, James Zedarian and one more question after him, and then we will adjourn to the corridors of life. James.
Yeah. Uh, I I speak a day when when we have a society that is so electronically transparent that nobody has any secrets, and that we are comfortable with that state. Uh, I know that's a, an un, a discomforting thing to say, but I happen to live in a society that is not unlike that now. I mean, in a small town in Wyoming, everybody knows everybody else's secrets. <laughs> we have mutually assured destruction. <laughs> the problem is, you know, the, the struggle between the secrecy of the institutions and the privacy of the individuals and the way in which that's co-evolved, and I think it's going to be very important for us to to make individuals as capable of making themselves private as institutions are capable of making themselves secret before we can get down from that. That's part one of your question, and I'll let somebody else address the rest. Last question, please. Encountering through biotech life extension, and when you're looking at uh, living 200 years in good shape, that gives you a different relationship to things. To answer both this and the previous question, which I like a lot, since we got rosy glasses up here, what are the what are the serious problems that might come? I look at them in terms of accelerating pace. One would be is uh, how we relate to mistakes. When you go at a certain pace, mistakes are always being made. When you go relatively slowly, you learn from the mistakes and correct. When you go really, really rapidly, mistakes can cascade and bring down the whole system. So that's a serious fragility in an accelerating system. I think another one is that as portions of technology, fast-moving technology, basically of the culture, move very, very rapidly, not everybody can keep up with what's going on. But it has enormous force. As these things double, they just have huge influence in everything that goes on. So for many people, then, there's this huge force in the world which they cannot see because they're, they're, they're just only the surfers at the edge of that can know what's going on. And so you have, could have a society basically fractionating into people who have some sense of what's going on. Right now it's the young people because they're the ones who can keep up with the pace of change, and the old farts will get you know, left behind. Maybe that's good. I'm not sure. But I think there's a possibility of serious fractionating of society over this pace issue. Neil Postman, 10, you know, 10,000 DNA, human society. This young man uh, wants and needs an answer. Here it is. Will we be here in 10,000 years? Yes. <laughs> don't, don't you feel better? No. Jim O'Donnell. This is going to be a longer panel than I thought. I'm not planning on being here in 10,000 years. I don't much care, but I feel a responsibility to try to facilitate it if possible. I'm afraid my email is going to be here in 10,000 years. <laughs> I spent the first 
the first 40 years of my life assuming every time I read a science fiction novel that took place in the 21st century that it was ridiculous because I was the last generation in, in humankind. We were going to blow ourselves up. Amen. I mean, I, I can't tell you, I don't think we've begun to analyze Amen. what an effect that had on the consciousness of practically everybody in society, that assumption. I no longer make that assumption. Uh, I think that the most important thing I can do with my life is to be a good ancestor. And the reason that I feel that way is because I think we will be here in 10,000 years. And we, will, and we can assure that by the actions we take now, today, with regard to this immense opportunity. Amen. And thanks to everybody. We've had this food for thought here for, to go all night. Uh, a conversation on the connection will resume with Larry Lessig on Wednesday morning. Be there or be square. Thank you. Yeah. Let's do it. Uh, I'd like to ask everyone, please, to remain seated while our panelists uh, go upstairs uh, to the lobby, please. Uh, just a few closing remarks. Hello. I'll be quick, I promise. I'd like to thank you all for coming this evening. This is our first annual technology and culture uh, panel discussion. Our next one will probably be biotech and culture, so um, we'll keep you posted. Um, if you go to either harvard.com or cyber.law.harvard.edu, you can sign up for future events like this one. I'd like to thank our panelists and Christopher Leiden. And as long as our panelists have already gone up, um, you can feel free to go up to the lobby, purchase books, and have them signed by the authors. Thank you very much.